friends, if we could have, um, we're going to escort um, the casket from the hearse behind the pallbearer. So if you're a designated pallbearer and everyone else, please go to the hearse and we'll come back to the gravesite together. going to begin the funeral service for Mrs. Selma Biller. If you have a cell phone, I'd ask you kindly to place it in a silent mode or turn it completely off at this time. Also, on behalf of the family, I'd like to thank anybody also attending via live stream. Thank you for being with us as well. And services will be conducted by Rabbi Nancy Landsman. If you don't have a folder, please see us. It's got some of the prayers to follow along. Thank you. There are some people raising their hands, so if we have some more, just raise your hand and a service folder will be handed to you. It's truly an honor to be officiating this service today for Selma. Although I probably met her many years ago when I served as cantor at Am Shalom for 23 years, a long time ago, before becoming a rabbi, um, I never really knew Selma, so I'm so grateful to her family taking the time to share their memories and to paint a picture of her incredible life, about which we will be hearing in just a few moments. It's customary to begin the service with the traditional act of Kriya. Sometimes direct mourners will make a tear in their clothing, but other times um, they choose to make a tear in a Kriya ribbon, which Andrea, Carol, and Ralph, you've all been given a ribbon, and if the three of you can please stand. Before making a tear in the ribbon, let me point out that the ribbon is pinned over your left side, over your heart. And it's only children who have the ribbon worn on the left side. Every relationship is special, but there's something extraordinarily special about a relationship between parent and child, which is why your ribbon is over your heart. There are traditional Hebrew words that are said before making a tear in this ribbon, so I invite the three of you to repeat these words after me. Baruch, Ata, Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech, Haolam, Dayan, Haemet. These words mean, praised are you, eternal our God, ruler of the universe, judge of truth. 
From the bottom of the ribbon, you'll need two hands. You'll make a little tear. You can tear it a little or all the way up towards the circular button. You have a choice to wear this torn ribbon. Sometimes they tear easily and sometimes they're a little stubborn. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much you tear it. There you go. Yeah, you can choose to wear this torn ribbon only today. You can wear it the first week of mourning or what we call the period of Shloshim, 30 days. You also have a choice to wear the Kriya ribbon tucked in the inside or on the outside for others to see. If you choose to wear the Kriya ribbon on the outside, hopefully people will understand that you are in a period of mourning and they'll have compassion on you. Please be seated. In learning about Selma, I have selected a few readings and poems that I felt were fitting for her and for her beautiful family. To this sacred place we come, drawn by the eternal ties that bind your souls to the soul of your beloved Selma. An unknown author wrote, a life well lived is a precious gift of hope and strength and grace from someone who has made our world a brighter, better place. It's filled with moments sweet and sad, with smiles and sometimes tears with friendships formed and good times shared and laughter through the years. A life well lived is a legacy of joy and pride and pleasure, a living lasting memory our grateful hearts will treasure. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, what is success? To laugh often and much to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. I think we can all agree that Selma succeeded big time in so many ways. She improved the lives of so many just by the nature of her being a nurse. She was so full of love and compassionate. She had a big giving heart. And I think no matter how many years a person is granted, and she was granted quite a bit. <laughs> so I think it's still hard when a day like this comes. We're never really prepared or wanting to say goodbye to somebody that we love so much. Many find comfort when turning to the book of Psalms. Psalm 121. <speaking in Hebrew> I will lift up mine eyes unto the mountains. From whence shall my help come? My help cometh from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel doth neither slumber nor sleep. 
I invite you to turn to your memorial folder where you find the 23rd Psalm, a psalm that I think speaks to all of us, regardless of our faith. And so I'd like to invite all of you here, as well as those of you joining us remotely, to join with me in reciting the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Salma was blessed with a beautiful family that loved her so very much. And she loved all of you. You know that. This beautiful poem, whose author is unknown, wrote, one of the greatest gifts that life can give to anyone is the very special love that families share. As years go by, it's good to know that there will always be certain people in our lives who care. For there are countless things that only families have in common and memories that no one else can make. And these precious ties that bind a family together are bonds that time and distance cannot break. How fortunate we are when we have relatives to love us. It makes the world a happy place to be. Few gifts in life will last as long or touch the heart as deeply as the very special gift of family. We have a few speakers today. It is my honor to first call upon Selma's granddaughter, Joanna. Now you can hear me. <laughs> Grandma, gracious, glamorous, and genuine, ravishing redhead, avid card player, noodle kogo perfectionist, devoted and delightful, mahjong and may I master, admirable, Selma, sweet and sophisticated, elegant and energetic, lovely and loyal, marvelous and magical, affectionate and accomplished. These are only a handful of a million ways to describe the person that you were. Grandma, I know you are out there listening and watching down right now, but just in case you don't recognize my voice, it's your sweet, sweet Joanna. You started off every single card that you sent to me, dear sweet, sweet Joanna. We truly had a special bond like none other. Every time either one of us had an ailment, the other had the same. I remember calling you one day, saying that I had a bad case of double pink eye, and you responded, oh Joanna, I just came from the eye doctor and something is wrong with my eye too. I called to tell you I needed a tooth implant, and you said, oh Joanna, I was just in the dentist chair having work done. I hope this means I have your genes and I will live just as long as you were blessed to live. We always knew what the other was thinking and sometimes could even finish each other's thoughts. We kept each other's secrets to this day. 
We shared a love for watching Dirty Dancing and Beaches. To the point whenever either was on TV, we immediately called to let each other know. You ended every phone call with, I love you, my sweet, sweet Joanna. I love hearing your voice. Please take care of yourself and kiss and hug those two beautiful boys. I honestly believe our bond was extraordinary and one of a kind. I know this because just the other day after I spoke to mom, I had a very surreal moment. Sadly, she informed me that you were not doing so well. This upset me so, so much and put a pit in my stomach. Later that night, I had a breakdown in the shower. In the midst of my episode, I felt a surreal and very strange sensation in my body. I got out of the shower and immediately called my mom hysterically crying. Barely able to get any words out, I kept saying I was just so sad, so sad. She said to me, trying to calm me down, Joanna, Joanna, take a breath and just listen. Grandma is gone. I said with tears gushing down my face, Mom, I knew it. I knew it. I just knew it. And at that moment, I came to realize that what I had just experienced in the shower was you telling me you were ready to go. That was your goodbye. I wasn't able to say goodbye in person or even on the phone, but this was your signal to me. You couldn't leave without saying goodbye to your sweet, sweet Joanna. I continued to cry and cry, but then realized that this was truly a blessing in disguise. Now you are no longer suffering in pain. You are finally at peace. You have started your next journey, and what a better way than to be reunited with all of the loved ones who couldn't make it as long as you did. I bet you are somewhere on the beach in Acapulco with the love of your life. I know Grandpa Mori has been patiently waiting for you, along with Nana Jenny, your brothers and sister, Auntie Edie, Uncle Al, and all the rest of the family and your lovely friends. You can now be at peace, pain-free, surrounded by the ones you loved and happily go enjoy your new life. There are so many memories and stories to be told about the crazy shenanigans with your four amazing grandchildren, just to name a few. Flying crackers into the pool and David jumping in to save them. David and Ben deciding to stay and ride on the tube in London when the rest of us got off. Me getting hit by a motor scooter in Italy. Knocking David out of the raft while we were whitewater rafting. <laughs> Calling your calling out your name frantically to come to our room in the house. <sighs> on Burning Tree Lane, where we put the giant pillows on top of the door so they would fall down on you. Gotcha every time. <laughs> Smushing in the back of Grandpa's caddy to drive to Bush Gardens with the ceiling falling down knowing your car was on because the lady would say, key is in the ignition. Constantly begging to go to Celebration Station and Country Pizza Inn. Playing hours and hours of Mei Ai and Mahjong. And just so you know, I strategically sat next to you so that you could feed me the cards or tiles I needed. But it didn't matter because you always won every single time. Grandma, you really were a lucky lady. You lived a full, long, joyful, and very busy life. You were blessed with four wonderful grandchildren and then eight amazing great-grandchildren. You had tons and tons of friends and you were always the life of the party, a great hostess, and loved to laugh. You were such a devoted wife. Not one single day went by when you didn't go to see and check in on Grandpa. You had a heart of gold, and I will forever hold a special place in my heart for you. I admire so much about you and hope that I can instill all of your amazing qualities into Asher and Silas. To sum things up, I want to share with you something that Asher wanted, me, wanted to make sure that you knew. He has been nonstop asking questions and talking about Gigi for the past six days. He melted my heart the other day when he told me after school that he thought, Mommy, we should go into a room and all be quiet to take some time to think about and remember Gigi. When I let him know that I would say what he told me to say to you, he wondered if you were going to be able to hear him. 
I assured him that even though Gigi is not physically here anymore, she is always listening, watching, and in our hearts. Dear Gigi, we loved you so much and you are the best Gigi in the whole wide world. We will miss you a lot and hope you are in a happy place now. Also, thank you for all the awesome presents. Love, Asher and Silas. Grandma, I love you, I miss you, and will continue to think about and talk about you all the time. You are forever in my heart. Love your sweet, sweet Joanna. And now it's my honor to call upon Selma's niece, Ruth. Auntie Selma. Auntie Selma. You were like a second mother to me. In fact, you were the one who called Carol, Andrea, and myself. Apple Sisters. Oh, we've lost our matriarch, and I am so, so grateful that you were a part of my life as a child, as an adolescent, and as an adult. And you were there when you understood that I was in a vulnerable spot. I didn't have an easy time in adolescence and I could turn to you and you understood that we had difficulties. And she would tell me that it's not important that everybody like you, but you have to know who your real friends are. And you were just such a comfort to me. And we would laugh. You did have a tendency to laugh at my ridiculous sense of fashion or lack thereof. And rather than be critical, we would laugh about it. But then you went further. When I was at Brandeis, one day a package arrived and I opened it up and it wasn't even my birthday or anything. You had been thinking of me and you sent me this beautiful Merlot floor-length halter dress. I mean, it was the most beautiful thing I ever owned. And you did that just because you wanted me to be pretty. And I loved that dress because every time I wore it, I thought about you. And our laughs together. I remember the time that Carol and I vacationed in Clearwater. And frankly, it was a day sort of like today. We thought it was going to be warm. We had our bathing suits on, but we had our ski jackets over our bathing suits. And Selma came out and just started laughing. But then she reminded us to wear sunscreen. And Selma would, Selma would think of those things. She cared. She, she cared so much. And she, she was also fierce, and one of the things I loved is she would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with my father, and uh, she did not like bullies, and she would stand up for herself, and frankly, she was a great role model. Um, I really, I loved that. You were such a wonderful sister-in-law. When, when, my, when my mother developed Alzheimer's, my father was able to turn to you and you were so supportive. And one of the things that stands out the most in my mind was as my mother became more and more compromised. She really thought so much about her two older brothers, who even though she didn't recognize her own illness, knew of theirs. 
and she's kept on saying, I have to see my brothers, I have to see my brothers. But then she would remember that Selma and Edie were there and that they were looking after her brothers. And it brought, it brought her such a sense of comfort knowing that Selma and Edie were there. And that was such a gift that you gave her that, that she could rest easier knowing that her brothers were taken care of. And when I went through some of my major life changes that many people did not approve of, you were so supportive of me because you told me that I deserve to be happy. And when you met Stephen, you just were so welcoming to him. He really wanted me to, to tell you how much he appreciated that. And I can't tell you how much it meant to me. You were there for me when my mother could no longer be. And when I needed support, you gave it so generously. So thank you, Selma. I, I, I know I tried to tell you some of these things, but maybe I didn't say it enough. So I'm telling you again, thank you. Thank you so much. You were so wonderful. And now it's my honor to call upon Selma's children, Andrea, Carol, and Ralph. You're right. <laughs> oh, I thought you were right. Oh, you want me to Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I can do this. Um, before we start, I would just like to send our love out to Mom's brother, Jack, who couldn't make the trip today from Las Vegas. I know he's watching us. I want you to know how much we love you. We know how much you love mom and how much mom loved you and we're thinking of you. And one day you'll get to tell us all those special stories. There's a lot of them. Okay, so it's difficult to express my thoughts about mom. We spent a lot of time together these last few years and my memories, emotions, thoughts, they tend to jumble together. So hopefully I can share a few anecdotes about her to try and give you a more fulsome sense of Selma. You all know mom was one of a kind. When I think of her, I think of Benjamin Button or Dorian Gray. She didn't exactly get younger, but she certainly got better than the rest of us. She always looked great. She was always there. She lit up a room. Her purple nail polish was the talk of the town and I always said, Mom, it matches your veins. <laughs> I mean, when COVID hit and everyone went gray because it was vogue to be gray, her hair managed to get redder and brighter. She was beautiful even till the end. Mom was a stud -ass. She <laughs> loved working out at the Y and I have to tell you, she was still taking two or three back-to-back -back classes twice a week this past year. Okay, there were silver sneakers, it was a little beneath her, but she suffered. And as recent as two weeks ago, she was kicking butt in chair yoga and Tai Chi class. You can't make this stuff up. As Jennifer reminded me today, Gigi was bold and brazen. Mom loved to tell the story of the time she was in Publix and she tried to reach up and tap the shoulder of some seven foot lumberjack to tell him to quit smoking in the store and she kicked him out. She was extremely outgoing, even though she would say otherwise. She loved to start conversations with strangers when we went out. It was always you're going to Bell's, you're going to this. It was always a day trip because we had to talk to everybody. And you know what? Everybody knew her name. It took her two hours to grocery shop for 10 items at Publix because we had to stop and chat with everyone she knew personally 
and the bakery, the produce department, the checkout line. And she always asked for the complimentary children's cookie. And she always got it. Mom, in recent years, she loved to go to the bank and always took out $500. Unlike the rest of us mere mortals, she never had to show an ID or a debit card. She walked in and whoever was working that day said, oh, Mrs. Biller, how would you like your money? How many hundreds? How many fifties? How many tens? I had to go struggle with the cash machine, but you know, whatever. Mom, she had so many different interests. She loved the theater, she loved the arts, she loved cards, as everyone said. She was passionate about politics and the news. And her TV was always tuned to CNN or MSNBC. Once in a while, PBS would get a nod. And even when she wasn't quite sure in recent months what day it was or where we were going, she could still follow politics and current events better than most of us. Mom was a closet sports fan. Um, she, I thought she was a Yankees fan. Apparently she was a Dodgers fan, so I didn't even know that, but um, someone told me that. When she moved to Chicago, she became a Bears fan. In 1985, for Super Bowl, she had a kick-ass Super Bowl party. She posed with her giant-sized cutout of refrigerator Perry, Perry, whatever his name was, Refrigerator <laughs> Perry, William Refrigerator Perry. When she moved to Florida, she, you know, and finally said after five or ten years it's okay, I'm in Florida, she became a Bucks fan. This last year, every single Sunday, she started calling me, what time is the game? What channel is this on? Who are they playing? Then an hour later, I get the same call and the same call. She watched those games. Somehow, whenever the game was on Fox, she managed to watch the Spanish broadcast. I always wondered if the closed captioning was in English or Spanish, but she still figured out who won the game. And the next Monday, she played cards with her friends. It was like being at the water cooler. She gave them the play-by-play, -play and she told them what the team really needed to do. And of course, when Tom Brady showed up, he was so cute, she loved that. Not as politics, but she loved Tom Brady. Um, probably something a lot of you didn't know is mom was the original groupie. Back in the day, she and her high school girlfriends chased after Frank Sinatra and went to concerts in New York and New Jersey whenever they could score a ticket. I spent a lot of time with mom, as I said, these past few years. It wasn't always easy. We did a lot of the hard stuff. And it's hard sometimes to express your memories when you're going to the doctors and you're doing this and you're doing that. But she, as I say, she was, she was one of a kind. And no one was more passionate about her family than mom. She loved the three of us, each in her own way. She loved and adored each of her four grandchildren, Benjamin, Jennifer, David, and Joanna, each in her own way. And she loved, adored, and cherished each of her eight great-grandchildren, Simone, Bear, Drew, Lee, Asher, Silas, Raymond, and Camille, each in her own way. She said so many times that she wanted the greats to remember her, and I know that they will. Mom, know how much I love you and how much I'll miss you. I can safely say that you'll be greatly missed and loved by all. This will be the short piece. My mom lived a full and wonderful life. She was born and raised in the Bronx and met my dad on the beach while on vacation in Acapulco in 1947. My dad would come to New York to court her and they were married in March of 1948. She moved to Chicago where we were raised and where my mom had a career as a registered nurse. My mom loved traveling the world with my dad she was very involved in charitable giving throughout her tenure in ORT, including serving as a chapter president. She also loved attending 
the symphony and theater with productions, first with my dad and in later years with Andrea. She enjoyed playing cards and was an avid duplicate bridge player. Our family moved from Chicago to Clearwater, Florida in 1973. It was a difficult transition for my mom at first, like she hated Clearwater, but <laughs> <laughs> gradually she developed a wonderful network of friends. She enjoyed playing poker, canasta, and pan with them. She relished in the joy of her family and friends and loved to make her famous noodle kugel for various gatherings. On a personal note, I would like to give a special thanks to Andrea for everything that she persevered through during the latter stages of my mom's life. It was a difficult burden and Andrea powered her way through all the difficulties and hardships. And for that, I will be forever grateful. Rest in peace, mom, and rise up to heaven and reunite with dad and Uncle Al and Aunt Edie. I call you the Fab Four and all of your family members and friends. I love and miss you, Mom. Thank you. Okay, the closer is here. <laughs> Laugh away now. <sighs> Andrea, my dear sister Andrea, does not care for being in the spotlight. But my brother Ralph and I agree that she deserves to be honored publicly for her extraordinary courage, compassion, respect, and care for and of our mother. Andrea has been a saint. This role has never been in her wheelhouse. Yet she chose to dedicate herself to caring for our mom over fully living her own life. She is responsible for mom being able to stay in her own home and live independently until just five weeks ago. Andrea, you were her rock. We owe you and give you our respect, our love, and our gratitude forever. I must also say, Scott, you have been Andrea's rock. You were by her side through all the phone calls and late night, you must come over right now visits. You fixed the telephone, you fixed the televisions, you rebooted the computer, you fixed the remotes, you changed the light bulbs as soon as they went out, you fixed leaky toilets and the window shade and leaky ice makers and so much more. I could go on, but truly, Scott, we are thankful and beyond grateful for your compassion and your support and love for both Andrea and Mom. I know that we love you dearly. So my mom, Selma, was never just one person. I think you've heard that already. She was able to sense what you needed and became that person for you. She could be understanding, strong-willed, sympathetic, direct, compassionate, and definitely in charge. She had a vision of the person she wanted each one of her children to be and tried to steer each of us in that direction. And she never, ever quit trying to guide us to that place. You've heard her extraordinary history. I don't need to go into that again, but I wanna share with you my reflections on our end of lifetime together. As my mom's health declined, she began to rely on me more for medical information, for some hands-on care, and for companionship. I traveled to Florida more frequently and for longer stays to provide relief for Andrea so that she could re-enter her own life and to provide support and companionship for my mom. Those times I spent 24 hours a day with her 
some good days and nights, some more challenging. We developed a pattern for our days and nights. She would rise early, eat her first breakfast, and go back to bed. I would awake a bit later and go for a solitary, introspective one-hour walk. I would come back to find her seated at the table, waiting to be served her second hot breakfast. I had one condition, though. We must sit at a proper table, and that meant placemats, china dishes, napkins, cutlery, glasses for water and juice, mugs for coffee, and of course a dessert plate for cake or a biscotti at the end. She told me I should quit nursing and become a chef. <laughs> we would try to do one or possibly two things each day, a doctor's appointment, a trip to Publix or Target, looking at the makeup, or a stroll in the neighborhood. On a good day, we would go to Nordstrom Rack or to the mall. I insisted we return for lunch, and I insisted, again, that she eat and have a rest. Most nights, she refused to eat dinner. I said, okay. But as soon as she saw me preparing a salad or baking chicken, she joined me at the table, ready to be served. And again, she told me she liked this restaurant. Okay. And then it was TV time. It took a bit of convincing on my part, but she agreed to sit upright on the sofa with me rather than going back to her bed. We agreed that we would find a mutually acceptable program. That meant reruns of Barbara Streisand concerts, reruns of Masterpiece Theater episodes, and perhaps a current or older movie. And then I introduced her to my guilty pleasure. And our evenings changed. Now, I promise never to admit to this in public, but I feel it appropriate to break that promise today. I pulled up episodes past and present of The Masked Singer. She watched, looked at me like I was absolutely nuts and said, you like this? And then she said, it was the craziest show she had ever seen on television. But she loved the makeup and the fabulous costumes. And she laughed with gusto. And she was in awe of my ability to correctly guess the singer behind the mask. And now, you must all forget I ever said this in public. <laughs> and when it came time for me to leave and return to Chicago, she hugged me tightly, and with teary eyes, she thanked me for taking care of her and told me she loved me and asked me to please come back again soon. Most afternoons, no matter the season, as the sun sets and the light fades, I feel chilled. I reach for a comfy, comfy throw, wrap myself in it, and it feels like a big warm hug. I close my eyes and I see my mom and me sitting on her sofa with a throw across our bodies. I feel the weight of her tiny body pressed against me. I feel the softness of her skin and I feel her warmth and smell her scent. And she turns her head towards me and looks at me, and I see love and contentment in her eyes. And she sees it back in mine. I know she loves and loved and loves still me deeply, and I know she feels that love come back from me to her. But now she is gone. And when I put that throw around me now, the world has shifted. I feel the pattern of her faded life cover me and imprint itself on my skin. And if you'd close your eyes and try, you may feel it too, because she loved each and every one of you. Mom, 
you have crossed the river and are reunited with family and friends who passed before you. And I know you, ma'am. You have been watching and listening to all of us. So hear me, ma'am. All of us here are okay. We miss you. We love you. We know that you are at peace. Please listen and hear me, ma'am. You will not be forgotten. You are a part of all of us now. Hear me, ma'am. It's time for you to let go, fly free, and see what new adventure awaits you. I love you. Goodbye, ma'am. It's clear how loved Selma was. As I told the family, I'd like to go last and fill in whatever blanks might be left. And there really are not too many blanks. She was a loving daughter to Meyer and Jenny and a loving sister to Jack. Again, our, our thoughts go to you. Sorry, you can't be here physically today, but also to, to the late Aaron and hi and Florence. She was a wonderful not only mother but mother-in-law to Scott and Bernie and Karen. The family recalled some wonderful trips that Selma was able to take. A trip to Europe, to China, to Israel, to the Rockies in Canada, to Colorado, and living in Florida. Not too many adults choose to become bar or bat mitzvah, but Selma did. She became a bat mitzvah as an adult. If we can all just think of Selma's incredibly full life that she lived. She may have been small in stature, but she made her presence known. And there she is, the wind, right? I was gonna, she had this glow around her. Somebody in the family said that, and, and also shared that she was the balabusta of her family. She did such an outstanding job in maintaining her home and organizing everything for her family. She was the center, the glue that brought all of you together. She was completely devoted to her beloved Maury. 58 years they drank from the cup of life. Her generous spirit and desire to give and help others was commendable. All of you will remember Selma's beautiful red hair and her purple nails. But more importantly, you will remember how present she was in your life. How she always remembered your birthdays, your anniversaries, all the special occasions. She will never be forgotten and she will remain forever in your hearts. As we bid farewell to Selma, our nurse angel. Let us pray that her spirit continues to watch over us, guiding us to be compassionate and selfless, just as she was. May the memory of her countless love serve as a source of inspiration for us all. May she rest in peace. Zecher tzadik libracha, the memory of the righteous is forever a blessing, and to that we say, Amen. The dust returns to the earth as it was. The spirit returns to God who gave it. It is only the house of the spirit which we now lay within the earth. The spirit itself cannot die. We pray to you, O God, to receive in mercy the soul of our departed, 
Selma Biller. David Harkins wrote, you can shed tears that she is gone, or you can smile because she lived. You can close your eyes and pray that she will come back, or you can open your eyes and see all that she has left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see her, or you can be full of the love that you shared. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember her and only that she is gone, or you can cherish her memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn your back, or you could do what she would want, smile. Open your eyes, love, and go on. In a moment, we will be reciting the two concluding prayers, which you find in your service folders. First, underneath the 23rd Psalm, you find El Malay Rachamin. And on the back cover, the final prayer is the Mourner's Kaddish. It is customary that we rise for these prayers, so if you are able to rise, please rise. Let us say the translation together. O God, full of compassion, thou who dwellest on high, grant perfect rest beneath the sheltering wings of thy presence among the holy and pure who shine as the brightness of the firmament unto the soul of Selma Biller who has gone unto eternity. Lord of mercy, bring her under the cover of thy wings and let her soul be bound up in the bond of eternal life. Be God's possession and may her repose be peace. Amen. And now we join together in reciting the mourner's Scottish, which you find on the back cover. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei raba b'yama divrach hirute v'yamlich malchute b'chayichon v'yomechon v'chaye d'chol beit Yisrael ba'agala v'vizman kari v'imru Amen. Yehe shemei raba mevarach le'olam ulome amaya yit parach v'yishtabach v'yit pa'ar v'yit roman v'yit nasei v'yit hadar v'yit ale v'yit alal shemei 
Ebei de Kudusha, Borichu, Leela, Minkol, Birchata, Vishirata, Tush Bechata, Venechamata, Da Amiran Baalma, the Imaru, Amen. Yehe Shalama Raba, Min Shamaya, Vichayim Alenu, the Alkol Yisrael, the Imaru, Amen. O se shalom bim Romav, who ya ase shalom alenu, the Alkol Yisrael, the Imaru, Amen. May the author of peace send peace to all who mourn and comfort all the bereaved among us. And to that we say, Amen. It's, yeah, it's been raining, which is why I put my hood up. <laughs> uh, why don't you, and it's just tears, right? You may be seated while they use the equipment to seal the vault. We'll do that. At the end. So let them seal. us, for those of us who choose not to be buried in Israel, we bring a little Israel here with this pouch of holy earth from the Mount Olives in Jerusalem, Israel. I will ask in a moment for, that Selma's children and their spouses share the contents of this holy earth and place it into the grave and then lead all of us who are gathered here today to participate in what some say is the greatest mitzvah, meaning good deed of all, and that is to participate in the burial process. It is customary to place three shovels of earth into the grave or three handfuls of earth into the grave. There are shovels on both sides of the grave, so after Selma's children and their spouses place the holy earth and they do three shovels of earth, I'll ask you to form lines on both sides of the grave. After you're done with your three shovels, we ask that you do not pass the shovel. Put the shovel back down where you found it. The reason we never pass the shovel is we would hope that each individual participating in this mitzvah, this good deed, would do so from his or her own free will. So walk up carefully to the grave. I'll place some earth into your hands.
So the earth is quite heavy today from the rain that we've had. So it doesn't matter how much earth you get onto the shovel or into your hand if you choose to put three handfuls of earth. The other thing you'll notice, sometimes people turn the shovel upside down, sometimes just for the first of the three shovels. And that is to symbolize how difficult it is to bury somebody we love. It's hard enough to shovel the right way, but when you turn the shovel upside down, it's even harder. So it's just symbolic. So if you want to start coming forward to participate again on either side of the grave, just be careful how you walk. When you're done shoveling, you can come back to make room for others and come back under the tent.
It is customary to recite the name of the deceased for the period of Shloshim, 30 days. You're all invited if you would like to come to a Shabbat service this evening. My congregation, it's Reform, Congregation Ahavat Olam in Glenview. We meet at 7.30. Whether you come or not, I am going to mention Selma's name before we all recite Kaddish, and you're all welcome to attend. So Peggy, you want to announce in the mic? This does conclude the service here at the chapel. You may retire to your cars. And on behalf of the family, thank you. The shiva box is in the purse, so I don't want that folded one.
for the family. So, uh, it's, it's hard, but it's, it's okay.